Starting recording, it says. Still says, oh, here we go. All right. right. I think we're on the air again. So welcome again to the show that has no name. May have a name someday, doesn't have one today. Probably won't have one tomorrow. And I am your host, Panyo Basa, and this is my special guest, Otto Excelsior. And uh, we are going to talk about the state of Buddhism in the world today. Um, Probably some emphasis on Western Buddhism, because we are Western Buddhists, more or less. But uh, might as well include Eastern Buddhism for a little uh, comparison contrast. Just to... uh, I, partly just to point out that, you know, all the corruption and, and just messed up of of modern Buddhism isn't entirely restricted to uh, the Western version of it that, that lefties have gotten their hands on. In fact, right. even some righties have, have messed up Buddhism uh, a bit in the West. So, um, I may as well uh, mention for the sake of background that I do have some experience with Eastern and Western Buddhism. I have more experience with Eastern than Western because um, I lived in possibly the most devoutly Buddhist country in the world for more than 20 years. That's uh, Burma, alias Myanmar. And uh, the people of Burma, the Buddhist people of Burma, have essentially a medieval attitude. it's it's similar to maybe like Catholic Europe 600 years ago. And what it means is you've got some really saintly old monks and nuns, you know, very devout, very saintly, got some wisdom to them, some, some kind of spiritual attainments. But for the most part, the church, so to speak, is very corrupt. And um, the the lay people tend to be better Buddhists than the monks, in my opinion. I've always, I've long been of that opinion that you go to a devoutly Buddhist place like rural Burma and the lay people, partly because they only have five precepts, you know, they follow their precepts much more seriously than the monks do. Whereas the monks, you know, they've got between two and 3,000 precepts you know, th- there's the standard 227 of the Padimokha, and then there's all these extra ones from from elsewhere in the in the the rules of discipline, and um, so they're they're very serious. The monks are very lax, like like I mentioned, as a general rule, but uh, they consider themselves to be practicing just genuine Buddhism. You know, they do not. I think pretty much all traditional. Buddhists from any country, any tradition, probably think that their tradition is the real deal. You know, that's essentially what the Buddha taught was what they are practicing. And it could be as different as night and day, but they just don't get it. They don't see it. They don't really want to see it. And that's just uh, an aspect of human nature, I think. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's strange how people can be such joiners. I've never really been able to understand how somebody can be even like a devout Democrat or a devout Republican and just get this idea in their head that whatever their party says is true and whatever, you know, disagrees with what their party says is just evil heresy. You know, there's even some of that in politics in the West. Certainly. Yeah. Yeah. So it definitely occurs in, in Buddhism, especially, well, maybe not especially Theravada, but um, just based on my experience, it definitely exists in Theravada. And so in in eastern Theravada nowadays, it's still pretty much that way where um, the ecclesiastical aspect is fairly corrupt because the overwhelming majority of monks really do not have a spiritual calling. They're not trying to practice strictly. You know, they're not trying to follow the rules of monastic discipline strictly. Uh, a lot of fortune telling and just, uh, uh, I don't know, just exchanging blessings for money, that kind of thing. Magical thinking. Yeah, to some degree. And uh, in Asia, like the, the the devout Buddhists, especially out in the villages, they just accept it without question. You know, it's just um, they have the religious mindset with regard to Buddhism, which is understandable because Buddhism is arguably a religion. But whatever the text say, you know, if it says that um, the earth is flat and, you know, they're going to say the earth is flat or um, they, they, can, they have like a spiritual materialism where they consider karma to be a kind of spiritual money. You know, it's like, um, I don't know if you ever read Burmese Days by George Orwell, 
No, no. Uh, yeah, it's it's he lived in Burma for a while, and um, the evilest person in the story is U- Upo Chin, and uh, his wife is this devout Burmese Buddhist lady who keeps telling him that he's an evil man that he's going to go into hell, and he just says, "Oh, you don't know anything. I'm going to build a pagoda." Because the Burmese had this idea, you build a pagoda, and that's, I mean, that's just a stairway to heaven. I mean, just pretty much a guarantee of heaven. And um, so that's that's kind of the, the Burmese attitude. It's, uh, you know, they, they do not dare to question monks as a general rule, just to, to like look at them with a critical eye, you know, to realize that, you know, right. they're you know, grabbing asses on the bus and this kind of thing. Some wow. monks do that. Not most, I'm glad to say, but I, I have seen it where, you know, just some monks are just really, just really lax, to put it politely, or, you know. Um, that probably explains why you could throw boulders at poachers in the middle of a forest and they didn't shoot you or anything. <laughs> you were telling yeah. me about, you were like really ranting at these guys once. Uh, yeah, yeah, just, I was living out in the woods in a, in a national park where poaching was one of the main, like, uh, the economic mainstays of the local villages, you know, you just go in and poach and cut down tropical hardwoods that you're not supposed to be doing. And, and, uh, yeah, there's almost no, um, like the, the fishing or the, the forest service guys really just take the side of the, of the humans because Asians tend to be people, people, you know, they're not really nature oriented people. Right. right. So, yeah. So um, that's that's essentially the state of of Buddhism in in the East, and it's being corrupted by Westernism now, especially in in countries like Thailand that are be- rapidly becoming more developed. And so, you know, there's the old saying in the Bible: you cannot serve both God and Mammon. And you know, when you're poor agrarians, you know, subsistence farmers, you don't have much Mammon to serve anyway. So it's just being religious comes more naturally than. You know, you're living in a, in a city and you've got the new scooter and the, the Western clothes and that sort of thing. You just start thinking like a Westerner because it's in style or something. Yeah, uh, yeah a lot of younger people in even in uh, Southeast Asia, like Theravada, Theravada Buddhist countries, you know, they, it's just sort of stylish to scoff at, at oh, uh, religion in general or Buddhism in particular. No. Makes them feel daring. Yeah. <laughs> Makes them feel like they're the they're the wise guys or something, and then all, really all you have to do is just look at at the monks and how sloppy they are as a general rule, well, just catching for money and that kind of a thing. Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, I'd say of of Asian monks, like at least ninety five percent really are not even making any kind of serious effort to uh, practice correctly. Hmm. So we uh, can. Well, I was going to say, you, you, but you know, <clears throat> you've, you've also pointed out in the past that a lot of these guys were basically made into monks by their families when they're very young. You kind of can't blame them too much if they don't really feel a vocation for it. And you know, uh, where else are they going to be able to, you know, eat and uh, have a place to stay? So, I mean, on the one hand, it's very. I mean, it kind of reminds me of what Gurdjieff said about people have the kind of religion that they are spiritually ready to understand. That's why very few people are able to. Um, really, I don't want to say exploit, but really able to reach the heights of their religion. Most of them are stuck in the gimme, 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 you know, uh, kind of phase of just asking for divine favors kind of deal. And, yeah, uh, rather than really practicing what the Buddha or Jesus or whoever said you should do, they just worship him. Right, and the, and the magical thinking. You know, if I do this, uh, it reminded when you were telling me about the pagoda guy, I was thinking of indulgences in the Middle Ages. Where you know it doesn't matter how much I sin, I'm going to build a church. I'm going to buy these indulgences from the Pope. They'll get me right in, you know. And they were selling those. I mean, technically, I think they still can. They just I don't think they've sold them much since the 1950s or 60s. I have to look that up. But uh, so I think no matter what your religious background is, um, you're going to have see similar behaviors from people. You know, you're always going to you know um, these people will always be with us. To paraphrase uh, that carpenter guy. Yeah, yeah, the majority of people are always going to be, you know, mediocre, you know, just by definition, you know, the average person is going to be mediocre and their religion or their spirituality will be mediocre at best. Although, I mean, you're going to have spiritually talented, gifted people, just like you have people gifted in music or mathematics, you're also going to have people gifted in like meditation. Just, you know, they're just born 
apparently. And they're, they're going to be found all over the world. And so they're going to be found in Buddhist countries. And you're going to have really wise monks and nuns and wise lay people also, just very devout, good people. They're just sincerely doing the best they can. And I would mention before we leave the issue of uh, Asian Buddhism and, and get the idea that it's you know 95% corrupt or whatever, that um, there are reform movements. You know, there's always going to be some kind of reform movement of like really strict monks living out in the forest somewhere. Like back in the 70s, there was a real upsurge of that, like in Sri Lanka. Um, mm-hmm. There have been movements like that in, in Burma and Thailand. So it's it's not all, it's all bleak, but it, it's also very traditional. And it's, uh, you know, once you hit the corruption, the, you know, the corrupt aspect of it, and which it goes back, you know, thousands of years at this point, 2000 years plus, because, you know, it's like probably the most mutation that's going to occur in a religion is going to be like during the first hundred years of it. Right. So, I mean, yeah. it's a lot of it is built in all these weird suttas and all the devotional, like the Buddha in some of the suttas, essentially bragging about how wonderful he is and encouraging people. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, so was, I can never really was, take it seriously. Wasn't there a thing when the Buddha was born, he took these steps? And said, you know, God's above, God's below. There's nobody like me, or something like that. Yeah, that, that was as soon as he was born. Yeah, yeah. He his mother had him. He didn't have any goop or anything on him, you know. Yeah, of course. Not the lubricated fluid or anything like that. Right, right, and he right. took seven steps towards the east, I think it was, with a lotus, like sprouting underneath each foot, so his feet didn't touch the ground. And right. then he made this announcement, you know, this is my last life. There's nobody greater than me, something like that. And then he just goes back to being a, an ordinary baby and small child. <laughs> yeah, um, definitely. I really see, you know, the, we talked about this before, but people have a religion, whether they know it or not. Buddhism, I don't think of as a traditional religion in the Western sense, but it certainly functions as a religion. For people and uh, and and for the spiritually mediocre, as, as you call them, I would say less talented um, for this sort of pursuit. Um, at least following five precepts helps them along. Whether you know whether they can really reap a, some kind of a higher intellectual um, you know kind of reward from this, certainly it helps them just live a better life and be happier in this world. Yeah. So, also, it's it's good for humility when you're you're actually bowing your head to the floor to somebody else. Um, yeah. In America, I mean, most Americans have got no use for that. I mean, most Western Buddhists just maybe if there's some exotic looking Asian monk who's relatively famous in Asia and comes to to America, and you know, yeah. they might they might be willing to do that, but they don't really know how to do it very well, though. No, I mean, I didn't either as an American. It was the first 20 or so times I bowed down to a monk, you know, touching your forehead to the floor. It was sort of like I would feel when I was dancing when I wasn't drunk yet, where you just feel very awkward and self-conscious, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But after a while, you just get used to it. It's just, you know, the thing to do is just fine. But um, at first, it's it's difficult just because Americans are uh, egalitarian, I suppose. Yes, yes. Well, when I first uh, came out to visit you at the monastery, you know, and of course, I, a lot of the um, people that support the monastery are expatriate Burmese people, and they, they do the full, you know, kowtow, uh, the full obeisance to the monks. And uh, at first, you got, again, as an American raised in a very egalitarian society, I was a little taken aback at first. I'm like, whoa. But then uh, I remember, um, and it was, I, I forget what uh, day it was, I think it was, it was, um, uh, the Katina, sir, uh, time I was there for Katina, and yeah. there were a lot of people there, and um, this woman was, a uh, nice matronly woman, was chit-chatting with the abbot, and they were like, you know, laughing and joking, and they seemed very comfortable, and then um, he, she was presenting something to him formally, and then, boom, she has, she looks very serious, he looks very serious, she, you know, um, she hands him something, gets down, does the full obeisance and everything, and then 20 seconds later, they're chatting like old friends again, so, you know, there was no you know, there, there was no, what's the word I'm looking for? No awkwardness about hanging out with monks, but there was also no hesitation about showing them that respect. That was just like, like you'd salute someone in the army if you were like a soldier or something. You know? Yeah, that's the tradition. Like um, a lot of men and boys will be ordained as monks or novices just temporarily, maybe just for a few days in, in Southeast Asia and in you know ethnic communities in the West. Um, and even your own, your own wife or mother 
will be calling you venerable lord and bowing down to you while you're wearing them. and then uh just go back to the way it was before after you've dropped out after after your vacation is over or whatever well it's like in the, the military you know you salute the rank not the person wearing it you know so, yeah yeah. So, uh, yeah, might as well uh, go over into uh, the Western versions of Theravada <laughs> Buddhism then. And um, in, in some ways, it's similar to the Asian version, like we were saying before, that, uh, you know, you've got talented people, people with spiritual talent all over the world, and some of them are going to be in the West. There are some Westerners who are just naturally good meditators. You know, they just sit down and sit like a rock uh, without yeah. having to practice much. You know, it's just it just comes to them naturally. I think a lot of these people are the comp- have like a comp- compartmentalized mind. You know, it's like some people have like an integrated mind where you sit down and like your whole personality has got to sit down in meditation, which is very difficult. Other people, they've just got like the meditation compartment of their mind. They just go into meditation mode and they can sit there like a statue and then they get up and start walking around making noise they're just as messed up as they were before because it just applies to this one part of their persona you know but almost like self hypnosis yeah so there are wise and serious western monks even or not western monks even just western buddhists western lay buddhists although it seems my experience with western buddhism is sort of the opposite of like Burmese Buddhism. I said most Burmese in in most parts of Burma uh, that are Buddhist, you know, the lay people are better Buddhists than the monks. You were saying, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but in, in the West, it seems to be the other way around where the monks are the really serious ones who are really willing to make the renunciation to break with their family and friends, you know, to renounce everything that they had attachments for, you know, pretty much. And uh, the lay people, um, a lot of them, they just think, well, just you just accept whatever parts of Buddhism you want and change the parts. <laughs> you know, yeah. And, or you can just believe pretty much anything and just call yourself a Buddhist. You know, like right. some celebrities do that, I think. Some musicians and so forth might mm-hmm. call themselves a Buddhist, but really they, they don't really know much about it. You know, it just sounds kind of cool or something. Yeah. So there and is they, a lot of that. And they, they, I think I've seen, I've met people who they seem to think it was simply an excuse to pursue whatever lifestyle they wanted. Oh, it's okay. I'm a Buddhist. They have these weird, and I think a lot of this comes out of these Mahayana ideas of the Buddha mind and everybody's really a Buddha and you can be enlightened and have sex and drink and this and that because this or that famous guru or sage did it once, like, you know, so many, um, so many hundred years ago. And uh, they don't really have, you know, I don't know, there's no grit um, when you just, you know, just develop your your philosophy to just basically suit your tastes like that. Yeah. In fact, uh, that reminds me of uh, my father, who considered himself to be a Buddhist. And um, I remember him telling me that, um, you know, in other religions, you know, something is right or wrong because God says so. But in Buddhism, there is no God saying so. You know, it's so it's <laughs> like whether something is wrong depends on you. And he just interpreted that to mean that you get to decide what is right and wrong for yourself. If you can justify something, then go ahead and do it. And um, I guess uh, uh, sort of uh, in his defense, I would say that he learned most of his Buddhism from a dead Vietnamese monk being channeled through a, a, wow. a middle, middle-aged housewife in a trance. Wow. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of sketchy, but... Um, yeah, kind of like uh, reading Lope Sang Rampa to learn about Tibetan Buddhism. Yeah, yeah, yeah I read one of his books a long time ago. Yeah, 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 yeah. He actually saw a Yeti. Yeah, wow. Hey, hey. Yeah. But yeah, no. Um, it's uh, it, it's funny because I, I, you know, you were the first person I could really have good conversations about Buddhism with, and I've learned a lot of my Buddhism from you. Um, and of course, um. You know, I, I read, and that's one of my things, you know, I don't know how to pronounce a lot of these terms, but I read a lot about it. And I would meet people, um, especially, you know, I worked in the arts for a long time. So you meet a lot of people that are like, you know, neo-pagans and this and that. And I met a lot of people who call themselves Buddhists. And I'm like, oh, great, a Buddhist. And I start talking to them. And after a short time, they didn't really seem to have any grasp of what the Four Noble Truths were. Yeah, Four Noble what? Yeah, the, the three refuges. I said, well, what are, you know, something about the three jewels. And they're like, what? I said, the three refuges, what? Um, and as far as precepts, get out of here. You know, they don't even know for precepts. Kind of yeah. But they just thought it was like kind of a cool thing to say and say, I'm not a Christian like my mommy and daddy were. 
And uh, like you say, Buddhism, a lot of people take it to mean, well, I get to decide for myself what I want to do. Yeah, and I think uh, Buddhism really started going mainstream largely because of boomers who were hippies back in the, the 60s and early 70s yeah. Oh, yeah. really wanted to you know, be different from their parents. So yeah. if their parents were church-going Christians, they wanted to be something different from that. So it turned out being, I guess for the hippies, it was mostly Hinduism. But um, I guess it was the beatniks that were more into uh, like Zen, that sort of thing. Yeah, you know, now that you mention it, yeah, um, I remember, um, you know, of course, Ramdas was a big influence on a lot of a lot of the hippie. Uh, oh, type. Yeah, so. But the uh, for the beat generation, yeah, I'm thinking back to reading On the Road and, um, you know, the books they were coming out with. Of course, their their Buddhism was very paradox i think in some ways because they they were they were looking at a buddhism which included the use of things like you know crystal meth and wine and uh what was yeah. the one story about the guy who said you know we got to go to this dhamma meeting and he's like no i'm going to stay home and drink wine and he's like oh you're not being a good buddhist and he went to the meeting and at the meeting they had like some lecturer who said oh we're going to talk about this master who used to drink wine and he's like oh i should have known and it was just all about uh, hey i didn't know you had a tail yeah no they <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> oh, ho, 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 what a good cat! Yeah, yeah, I think that was Jack Kerouac. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, remember, I haven't read these books in years, but yeah, yeah. It was like Gary that. Snyder was trying to get him to go. Gary Snyder was relatively yeah. strictly practicing, you know, Zen Buddhist. I think he still got drunk sometimes, but yeah, still messed yeah. around with girls and all that. But um, yeah, he was he was like. Uh, uh, riding tankers to Japan and you know doing the Zen monastery stuff over there and yeah the real deal yeah that's interesting how though I th you know you're right there the hippies want more Hinduism maybe it was the uh, there's you know the tradition of uh, of drug use in India that they all perceived I don't know how you know how yeah there's also more more acceptance of sexuality more acceptance of music you know in Buddhism it's one of the only religions I can think of that music is actually considered to be you know bad karma you know like immoral you know, ah uh, well, but uh, <laughs> says the musician. Yeah. But, but, but Buddhism was was popular in the West partly just because it was more or less atheistic and more philosophical than religious. Um, you know, most Western Buddhists really do not have much use for the devotionalistic aspect of bowing to statues and bowing to monks and the spiritual materialism of earning merit and that sort of thing. They just want to meditate, and a lot of them. Um, you know, they're meditating as kind of a natural substitute for Prozac or whatever, but... Yeah, it's a palliative rather than, you know, a step on the path. Um, yeah, no, I it's, uh, it's uh, in a way sad, but again, it, it also comes back to people find their level in any religion. And I guess some people are, you know, I don't know, I would, I would consider them completely outside the, at all. I mean, I remember, what was it, Alexander David Neal said, why do they even have to call themselves Buddhists? Nobody's forcing them to be Buddhist, but if they want to do all these things that aren't Buddhism, why don't they just call it something else? But, uh, yeah, well, I mean, she was a follower of Tibetan Buddhism, which is already pretty far removed in, in many respects from uh, what, oh, what, yeah. what Gautama she, Buddha was teaching. But she was also, uh, she was pretty well grounded, though, I, I believe in, uh, uh, I'm going to get his name right, Nargajuna's um, Madhyamaka uh, philosophy. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, I think you pointed out that was itself a reform movement. And yeah, uh, to some degree, it was a really good reform movement. Yeah, she she was she was very very much grounded in that. And uh, if you read that her book on uh, secret oral teachings, uh -huh. um, very very interesting. They they basically had the same attitude, and I kind of got this from the other books, which was that um, you can tell the secrets on the road. Some people, you know, they'll start yawning. They'll just walk away if they can when you start talking about these things. So it's not it's only a secret teaching, in as much most people just aren't interested in going that far. Yeah, like you go up to someone and, you know, like uh, 100 years ago, go up to someone and say, hey, E equals MC squared. You know, exactly. it's like, you know, for, for a physicist, oh, for a family, but, you know, the average person is like, yeah, so I don't care. Yeah, yeah. And um, so she and she was very, um, you got you got to give it to her. I mean, she went and studied in these hermitages for years. And, uh, she, you know, she, she was, as she called herself, a lady lama. You know, she was ordained and everything, so. Uh, she said the way she got into Tibet, you know, that was it was a very difficult time for foreigners to get into Tibet. And she said basically she had met the Dalai Lama, uh, not this one, but the previous one. And there had been like the usual sort of palace revolution or something. And he had, he had uh, left the country temporarily um, until his forces could get, you know, the Botala back under control. So I think he was in Sikkim or something. 
and he had a nice house there. So she went to visit him, and he's like, oh, a Western Buddhist. Hmm. And she fortunately, you know, spoke several Oriental languages and had studied studied uh, Buddhism extensively, or at least the books that we had. So she started talking Buddhism with him. And uh, she said, I think it was at one point she was talking to, I don't think it was the Dalai Lama himself, but one of the Lamas, and they were thinking, you know, she's just gaslighting him. So he came in and suddenly pulled out a piece of paper and asked her like seven or eight questions about Buddhism, very technical ones. And she got them all right. So the Dalai Lama sort of taken her more seriously. And then she went, she basically was talking to him and he says, well, where did you learn all this stuff? And he tried to explain that, she tried to explain that several Buddhist texts had been translated into French. You know, she was a French speaker. And he, the Dalai Lama went, ah, but you know, you're probably going to miss the point. You know, like you were saying about each ethnicity has its, you know, it's, you don't really understand the real Buddhism. And she goes, that's why I want to go to Tibet most holy because I want to study the real Buddhism. He was so tickled. He was flattered by that. He said, no problem. And, uh, you know, gave her uh, permission to enter Tibet at a time when very few Westerners could. Yeah. And with regard to um, upper class Burmese people in particular, um, you know, college educated ones, there's the ones that were, you know, wealthy. They just had this idea that only Burmese people can really understand Dhamma. That, you know, even Thais can't do it much, le you know, let alone Westerners. Right. You know, and then I've, I've was uh, spoken to by, you know, like rich college educated uh, Buddhists, you know, they're trying to explain to me just the basic fundamentals of meditation, you know, after I was already a uh, Tara, you know, or trying to explain to me who Mahasi Seattle was, who was like the most famous monk in, in, in 20th century Burma, you know. But um, the the poor people, um, you know, out the villagers, you know, they really, they really love me because in a way I was vindicating their religion. You know, I had supposedly left behind, you know, this, this country where everyone is supposedly, you know, rich and happy and everyone's Christian supposedly. And, you right. know, I had abandoned all of that and come halfway around the world to live in poverty with them. They, re they really, uh, they really felt proud and uh, kind of grateful about that, you know, setting aside all the talk about cultural appropriation and so forth. Right. Well, you know, I think it's true that most people who are, are truly devout, they recognize that they're not really going to be able necessarily to go the full nine yards, but they like to see someone else do it. They say, you know, I don't have the, 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 the gumption to go sit in a cave and not swat bugs that are biting me, but I'm glad someone does. It, like you say, it, it helps justify their religion that there are people that are keeping that going. Yeah, that's, that's one difference with uh, a lot of Western Buddhists, where Western Buddhists, they kind of resent that. You know, it makes their own lukewarmness seem not good enough somehow. You mentioned that before. Yeah, that seems kind of... You know, that sort of thing. <laughs> oh. But, uh, I mean, we might as well get into, the, like, one of the main uh, controversial points of Western Buddhism, and that is that it has been essentially uh, hijacked by... You know, progressivism or ultra liberalism or just leftism, cultural Marxism, whatever, whatever term is in style. This right. right. Add, add a noble truth or two. Yeah, yeah. They wanted to. Uh, I've I've seen a couple of articles where they're saying that uh, the second noble truth in particular should be modified, and it's just rip indicative of just a, a abysmal ignorance of Dhamma. You know, the second noble truth says whenever you're unhappy, it's because you you crave something. You know, yeah. you have attachment, you desire something. Yeah. And, you know, these these progressive Buddhists, quote unquote, are saying, well, that's not the only reason people suffer. There's also racism and systemic oppression and so forth, which oh, I mean, desire. <laughs> you know, those yeah. are all as, as though there wasn't racism and systemic oppression in the Buddhist time when he was, you know, formulating his system. Yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, he had the caste system in in India at that time. You know, right. you had um Definitely, the Aryans were considered to be superior than the, the little snub-nosed, dark-skinned people, you know, the Shudras and so forth. Right, right. No, no. Um, <laughs> it's just, uh, let's see, I lost, I lost my train of thought there for a moment. But um, when you, when you, what was it? Yeah, brain, brain is, uh, I'm on, I'm on, uh, so the folks at home know I have hay fever and I'm on hay fever medication. And uh, this is tobacco and just tobacco, so don't worry about anything like that. Um, oh, no, um, what were you just talking about? Well, we were talking about, uh, you know, ultra progressives and, uh, oh. you know, it's the opposite of, of the Asian Buddhists in, in some respects. Yeah, yeah, you know, it seems to me that, now I remember what I was going to say, that's why I have, I have notes here. Um, one of the, the most 
important parts of Buddhism, uh, traditional Buddhism anyway, as I've come to understand it, is the preservation and faithful transmission of the of the Buddha's words of of, of, the, of the of the scriptures, and like uh, we were talking about earlier um, today about they were formulated in such a way that they were passed on by word of mouth for centuries and finally written down. So it seems to me that if you're, oh, we got to change all this stuff, that is completely 180 degrees about from what the what the Sangha has been trying to do for 2,600 years, something like that. Yeah, Theravada Buddhism especially is like the most conservative in you know in the literal sense of the term for school of Buddhism and why Western liberals are attracted to that. You know, you know, you could say ostensibly it's because it comes closest to the Buddha's actual original teachings. But then when you immediately want to start changing that, it's uh, it's just kind of pointless. You know, sort of like uh, uh, Western women, especially wanting to be ordained as bhikkhunis, even though the bhikkhuni order came extinct, you know, about well, several hundred years ago. And then, you know, they're doing it for the sake of gender equality, but then they're trying to revive a system that was explicitly discriminatory against women. So then they have to just change the rules and, and change some of the other, you know, underlying infrastructure of, of the system. Just and it's, it's 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 sort of like the, the leftist attitude towards the U.S. Constitution. You know, it's a living document, which means you can reinterpret it or rewrite it. Right. It's just constantly evolving, supposedly, to try and work its way upward, progress up into yeah. pure communism, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Well, now you pointed out to me before, isn't like the most senior bhikkhuni is junior to the most junior male monk? Bhikkhu. Yeah. Yeah. Things like that, which, uh, and uh, and they, I think they kind of gloss over the fact that, uh, as I recall, the Buddha really wasn't that wild about the idea of creating bhikkhunis. Yeah, according to the original story, um, his 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 uh, stepmother, Mahapajapati Gotami, um, she was his aunt and his stepmother at the same time because his father married two sisters, and right. uh, she asked permission to be the first nun, and the Buddha just said, "Don't even talk about it. It's a right. bad idea. Just be quiet about that." And so, after a number of times of being rejected in this way. She just started following him around with, you know, dust in her hair and, you know, tears streaming down her cheeks, yeah, yeah. but stand outside his doorway and so forth. And so then the Buddha's cousin and attendant, Ananda, who always had a soft spot in his heart for women, you know, he kind of was remonstrating with the Buddha saying, well, can't women become enlightened just like men can become enlightened? And the Buddha, you know, he couldn't deny it. Right. So, and finally, he talks the Buddha into starting the Bhikkhuni order, the order of ordained nuns. And then the Buddha said, all right, but now you've done it. <laughs> because of this, because of women being ordained in the Sangha, that Buddhism will last only 500 years instead of 1,000 years. And, um, you know, that part just gets completely rejected. You know, it's like, well, the Buddha couldn't possibly have said that because, you know, that would make him a, a sexist or misogynist or something. It would make him a product of his time and place. <laughs> we can't yeah. have him just like a normal human being. Um, yeah. you know, I've noticed something else, and I've 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 read articles and, and heard about this every so often. But we're talking about like Westerners wanting to change Buddhism to suit themselves. They seem to not really like the idea of kama or karma, no uh, rebirth. Uh, and it seems to me it's because they they don't want to be responsible for anything they do. We have a culture of irresponsibility in many ways, and that's one of the as you know better than I, you know, we are the lords of our action. We we are the inheritors of our actions. Yeah. Um, that's a, that's a one-two punch to anyone that is trying to live a life where, oh, well, nothing I do matters, you know, and uh, yeah. I, I think they're basically annihilationists. Well, it goes even farther than that. I mean, according to Buddhism, all suffering is ultimately self-inflicted. You know, it's due to your own attachment, and that is volitional. So, which means you could do otherwise. I mean, you don't have to be attached to that. Right. And, I mean, that's just flies in the face of leftism where it's, you know, they're trying to blame somebody else. You know, the, the oppressed people are victims generally because of, you know, evil whitey has set up this system that's systematically designed to keep white people at the top, even though it fails <laughs> to do that because there are a number of ethnicities that are higher than white people that are conveniently ignored, yeah, yeah. But like economically with regard to prosperity and so forth. Sure. So there's that, and then you can call them annihilationists, but I don't think they like no self either. Although there are a lot of right-wing Buddhists who just cannot stand no self either. I mean, I've I've dealt with a few of them. 
you know, I've had people just hysterically raging at me, you know, saying that I'm a, a worshiper of Mara, you know, like the Buddhist devil, because I actually endorse Anatta, which is one of the three marks of existence in, you know, just basic right. philosophy. Well, you know, we've talked a little about that before. And, um, you know, when we say self, I take it what we mean is the ruminative consciousness we sometimes call the ego. Just the, the vision we have of the little guy in the driver's seat in my brain. No, it, it goes beyond that. The self is any kind of intrinsically real individual anything. Oh. So well, anything that has any, like, self-essence, you know, it's anything that, uh, you know, is just qualitatively separate from the rest of the universe. Is anything really separate from the rest of the universe? Though? Not according to Buddhism. You've got dependent co-arising where anything yeah. that exists is there only because of these other conditions that are like supporting its existence and you take away the supporting conditions and it disappears. You know, it's like right. a flame. You know, if you, if you were ever a boy scout or whatever, you know, you got the, the, the fire triangle, you've got fuel, oxygen and heat. And if those three, you've got them together, you're going to have a flame. Right. So it's sort of like the individual person is similar is, you know, it's not the same from one moment to the next. It's just this uh, convenient label that you stick onto some apparent phenomenon that is occurring but doesn't have any self-existence it's not the same from one moment to the next right kind of thing yeah. well there, there are lots of different interpretations of no self even in the polytext which indicates that it wasn't very well understood hmm. and well, that one difference between uh western buddhists and in eastern buddhists or asian buddhists i've never encountered an asian buddhist who was just vehemently opposed to the idea of no self or anatta whereas every time I've dealt with just somebody raging against the very notion of anatta, while at the same time considering themselves to be a Buddhist, you know, they've right. always been Westerners. Well, do you think that the uh, Eastern Buddhists are simply, you said before, that they tend to be more dogmatic? Do you yeah. think they're accepting it without thinking about it? Uh, to some degree, yeah. Like, there's a, a famous sutta called the Kalama Sutta, which is, you know, don't believe something just because it's a tradition. Don't believe something out of respect for your teacher. Don't believe something just because it seems like a good idea, and on and on. And uh, Burmese people will parrot that. You know, they'll point out the Kalama Sutta, trying to be, you know, sort of enlightened or wise or something. But the only reason they accept that is because it's in the scriptures of their religion. You know, if it was in the Quran instead of in the polytext, they, they would say, you know, it's just nonsense. Right, right, right. Yeah. No, um, you know, of course, I'd, and earlier when you were talking about the, the, the reality of, of uh, the self, I was, you know, I'm reminded of uh, Aristotle, who talked about the suke or soul. It was usually translated. And he said that um, just like, you know, you've got an eye, an eyeball, but you've got vision. Vision is like a function of the eye. Without an eye, there's no vision. And so uh, tsuke is a function of a living human being. If there is no life, there's no tsuke. There's no ego or mind. Um, I've always been, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a philologist, I, but I've always been interested in trying to figure out, because th this is a weird area of human thought anyway, when we're trying to, you know, we're, we're talking about our own minds. So um, just the translations, you know, tsuke, atman, um, and then, um, you know, you've got um, uh, spiritus, in Latin and pneuma. Yeah. So I think the Greeks had pneuma also yeah. spirit. Yeah. So they, um, you know, how do these correlate? And I, I know different philosophers probably had different ideas about it. But when when you hear about Buddhism, the, that there being the doctrine of no self, then you wonder, what is it that actually reincarnates? And I've always heard the response, well, the, the, the karma reincarnates. Yeah. So, the momentum you, of karma. Yeah. And that's why we can sometimes remember past lives we're remembering past karma it's it's possible yeah so you know i was trying I, to understand it it'd be some sort of clairvoyance if it wasn't that uh because you know I, i'm trying to understand this and this this is why i gotta admit I, i'm like wrestling with trying to find a, a metaphor for it because obviously like you said even in the, the buddhist time this might not have been understood very clearly but uh, i came up with the simile of um you know, the ego is an illusion, but, you know, that it's, it's an illusion, but it, it's real. It has it doesn't lack reality. And uh, I was I was actually told by other people this, you know, if you take a cigar in a dark room and you whirl it around quickly enough, it looks like a circle. That circle is an illusion, but it does have reality. And in the same way, your ego, like you're saying about the flame, it's just this constant vortex. It's not itself something solid. So I just thought to myself, well, reincarnation then is a reincarnation of that illusion. 
So yeah. if you're if you're yeah. remembering your reincarnated lives, that's just as much an illusion as this life. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, um, and it's it's hard to say exactly how accurate those past life regressions are. Right, right. But I I have read a couple of places over the years where the idea of reincarnation has been pretty much accepted at one time or another by just about every human society. Um, you know, certain church councils kind of stamped it out of Europe. And, and of course, we're talking at a time before dogma. Most people could believe whatever the hell they felt like believing in, like the, the Hellenistic and the, the, you know, the Rome, well, probably more the, uh, the uh, Greco Roman, you know, imperial age. But because yeah. uh, the Greeks still did have prosecutions for heresy and blasphemy. Remember? Yeah, there was, uh, what was his name, got driven out of Athens for saying that the sun was just a hot rock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course, uh, the famous uh, Socrates case. Uh, he and Alcibiades had been prosecuted for um, mocking the uh, mysteries of the oh, yeah. mysteries. Uh, although they I, they had drunk the kaikion, which we now think was some kind of a psychedelic drink. Basically, it sounds like they were just having a party and like, hey, let's drop some of this kaikion, man. Really good stuff. So, but um, yeah, no, um, there's just this um, universal almost feeling that we we were here before. You can even find traces in the Bible. You know, my father's house has many mansions. And I believe Jesus at one point, I forget which, which book or all three, but he talks about John the Baptist being Elias. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Elias. So, or, yeah, he said he was going to come back. And so I think one of his disciples asked him that, or one of his apostles, you know, he said he was going to come back and why didn't he? And then Jesus said, he came back. You just didn't recognize him. And then yeah. they knew that he was talking about uh, John the Baptist. Of course, if you're a... Um, a, uh, a supporter or at least a, a, an acceptor of the uh, Jamesian theory of psychology, um, you know, that perhaps we could look at the idea of past lives as being a kind of more internalized bicameral manifestation. I don't know if anyone's ever written or talked about that. That's interesting, but uh, I have to bring Jamesianism up all the time in these days. Yeah, yeah. At least, <laughs> at least once per video. At least once, at least once. So another uh, aspect of Western Buddhism that I've been kind of shocked at, and it's not universal, and you brought this up too in our conversations, is selling the Dhamma, like being charged money to go to Spirit Rock or somewhere like that to hear a Dhamma talk. And that's that's an incredibly no-no kind of a thing. For well, the same it thing. happens in the East also. I mean, there, there are some famous Seattle's in Burma. I assume it's this way in other Buddhist countries also, where... They're really good orators, you know, they give really good Dhamma talks, and so they charge through the nose for, for their Dhamma really? talk. Yeah, or, uh, you know, the, I, I knew this one monk who had this line of, like, herbal remedies that he was selling, and this... Oh, jeez. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that one is not peculiar to the West. Selling, selling Dhamma for money is, uh, yeah, definitely uh, the East is doing that one, too. But, I mean, Western Buddhism, like, after it has been commandeered by the left, uh, it more closely resembles, you know, like, Western Unitarianism than more than it resembles Eastern Buddhism. You know, it's the, the as talk about, you know, just like, uh, you know, white supremacy and patriarchy and, you know, gay rights and gay pride and, you know, all this kind of stuff. It's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's not in the texts, obviously. It's it's more of leftist um, leftist ideas that are just dressed up as Buddhism, and that's, yeah. that's really what has taken over Buddhism in the in the West. It's there are a lot of Buddhists that don't follow that kind of thing, although they tend to tend to be the loners. You know, they're just learning their Buddhism from books or yeah. watching watching my videos. How <laughs> quite a few people them contact me? Like just recently, a, a fellow in Argentina was uh, saying that he. He agrees with my assessment of Western Buddhism, how it's basically becoming, you know, Buddhism flavored progressivism. Yeah. He's asking me, I mean, do you know of any more? And I really couldn't come up with very many names, but mainly it's just because I'm not really conversant in uh, the Western Buddhist scene. I've heard I've heard a lot of names bandied around, but I don't remember them. I remember right wing Dharma squads, but uh, <laughs> I remember that. Yeah. Uh, no, um, it's, uh, well, again, the, 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 there's always corruption, and it always seems to me that the corruption in any kind of a religious organization or, you know, um, is always, seems to tend to congregate around the top. And like you were saying, like the lay people in, in, uh, in Southeast Asia, as opposed necessarily to the, the lay people here in the United States, tend to be more honest about their Buddhism than, 
you know, these these guys that are like, you know, charging money and actually touching money, no doubt. Which, well, there's uh, a certain humility in Asian Buddhists where, you know, they have respect for people that are practicing it better than they are instead of the more a resentment, which is more likely in the West. That kind yeah. of. Yeah, that resentment thing is seems very odd to me. Yeah, I mean, when I was first came back to America in 2011 and was visiting a Dharma center, you know, uh, an ostensibly Theravada Buddhist organization, and I was the only Theravada Buddhist monk in town, so yeah. I naively assumed that yeah. I would be welcome there as a kind of spiritual resource, you know. Yeah. And um, not only was um, I seen more as just a rival, you know, I was seen as competition by the teachers who were really... Oh their positions of authority and respect and all, but I probably got more cold stares. Oh, the kitty is scratching herself and shaking the camera. I got more cold stares in the Dharma hall than I did out on the streets of the, of the city. It's just, it was really a strange experience for me. It was, uh, it was like feast or famine, you know, in Amer in, uh, in Burma, you know, I literally, in some places I'd have a hundred people a day, just, you know, hitting the ground and going like, you know, yeah, trying to yeah. yeah, women women spreading their scarves on the ground for me to walk on that kind of stuff and then come back to america and it's like who is this guy and who the hell does he think he is more more of an attitude that or who's this guy in a toga yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah no that's um that's very odd but and again as you point out though for a westerner to pursue buddhism that seriously they do have so much more they have to sacrifice so the ones that do it are going to be the ones who are willing to go the distance you know yeah with, so i was saying earlier there's like maybe five percent of asian monks won't handle money even though it's strictly prohibited but of, among western monks it's maybe half you know which is 10 times better you know 50 percent is 10 times better than five percent yeah yeah and then the a lot of the ones that are the, the half that do handle money they're just naively following along with what the other monks are doing yeah you know, the, other, the asian monks around them didn't you say there was some sort of uh, medieval commentaries that you can use to kind of find loopholes and this and that, uh, or just about any behavior? Well, there is a, a little saying in, in Burmese, it's, we need that, chet that, which means if you're skillful in the rules of monastic discipline, you can kill a chicken. Because you know all the loopholes, you know, you know how to get around the rules you don't want. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So maybe uh, debit cards or something, in, on, with so, you know, that's in somebody else's name. You know, that I've oh, yeah. I've read uh, like disquisitions or what is it, uh, dissertations or, or something like that on uh, the, the money rules for monks written by three different Western monks. And all of them were essentially, you know, how close can you come to actually handling money without breaking the rule? <laughs> they're trying to find ways. Yeah, they're trying to find the exact cutoff line so that they can go right up to the line, you know. Oh, well, well, not handling money, that's it's really like Western Buddhism, Theravada Buddhism. I mean, there's definitely like handicaps because Theravada Buddhism was designed for Iron Age Northern India. You know, it's, it's designed to fit the culture of Iron Age Northern India, which needless to say is radically different from the modern West or the postmodern West. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So wow. not handling money. I mean, it was doable then. It's like when you're just, you know, wandering around and sleeping under trees. But right. in America, everything costs money, and you're not allowed to handle money. So it's it's really, uh, you know, it's one reason why um, I'm rather skeptical whether, you know, like a Theravadan monasticism will ever really, you know, sink deep roots into the West just because it's so alien that you, you know, you're like a, a tropical potted plant that has to live indoors in a special protected environment with, with people taking care of you. You can't just live naturally you know, outside in the right. wild, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. There was a lot less money in use uh, back in uh, the old days in India, a whole different, different culture and society. And yeah. Well, it was just being invented then, but I mean, it's, it's more dangerous now than then. That's true. It's kind of an innovation back then. Well, that's though why we need uh, a Buddhism for the West, Navakavada, which, uh, you know, is kind of a, kind of a catch all term. And uh, I like the fact that it's, it's, um, you know, it's very un unofficial, but just I think it does describe the idea of Westerners trying to be as good Buddhists as they can while taking, you know, you, you've got to take into account Western conditions, but you're not using it as an excuse to say, you know, oh, well, I can just decide for myself what I want. So sticking yeah. as close to it within 
because like handling money, it's, it's impossible. I mean, I could see ways of mitigating that maybe limit the amount of money you handle or, or the things you buy. But I don't think like, especially um, any, anyone that wants to take that next step to being not a bhikkhu, but somebody who's, you know, keeping more precepts and trying to, we were, we were talking about perhaps that like a Navakavadan Sangha might wear gray sweats. Yeah. Like yeah well, it seems to me like, um, you know, not everybody is just ready to follow it really strictly, but you, you should own that, you know, it's like, rather than change the rules to say, well, you know, we don't have to follow that rule. You just admit, you know, I'm not following that rule and own it and then, you know, continue with your life. I think that's yeah. that's important rather than like oh, what a lot of progressives are doing is just trying to change Buddhism. In fact, I read an article not long ago that was mentioning me. That's why I, that's why I was reading it. it was saying, oh, uh, you know, cool. Buddhism is what Buddhists do, which, of course, means that, you know, anyone can call themselves a Buddhist and do whatever they please. And that's what Buddhism is, which is, you know, really a nice, you know, leftist postmodern, you know, approach to yeah. people who can't even define the word woman. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah. Yeah. What was it? Uh, Charles Haywood said something about what is the goal of the of the left is is completely unrestricted, um, you know, freedom to to behave any way you want with no comeuppance, you know, with no penalty for it. Well, it, forcing it, it, other people to do what you want them to do, or at least not do what you don't want them to do. Yeah. Yeah. Restricting their speech and thus their thought, you know, really, because to my mind, if you're trying to say that people can't say certain things, that you're really that's just a step away from saying you're not allowed to think certain things. And yeah. you know, if they had a bit, you know, a machine that could read your thoughts, they they'd be advocating for people to go around and like double check to make sure you're not thinking the wrong thing. Yeah. Hate think. Yes. <laughs> there you go. It's scary yeah. too. Uh, there's two things I'd mention. I mean, we probably should uh, try and limit this to an hour. We're up yeah, to yeah. Yeah. But uh, one thing is just for, for those of you who aren't uh, conversant in the Pali language, the term Navakavada, um, it's sort of a, a, a response to the term Theravada, or as a lot of Western Buddhists will pronounce it, Theraveda, which means, <laughs> um, you know, the, the doctrine of the elders, you know, the elders being the senior monks, you know, who are, you know, disciples of the Buddha and you got the unbroken lineage and so forth. Whereas Navakavada is, is more appropriate to the West, where it's the, the doctrine of the newcomers, and that's us. We are the, the newcomers to Buddhism. We weren't born into it. You know, we don't come from a Buddhist culture. And so we're looking at it from the outside. We're kind of aliens to it. And we, you know, we, we really cannot accept it at face value the way uh, an Asian villager would, where, you know, you just believe all the miracle stories and all the fire-breathing dragons and ogres and all that. Or even the Buddha just in some suttas just bragging about how wonderful he is and how everyone should worship him. That kind of thing. <laughs> so there is that. But also, um, I was uh, did a video a few weeks ago with uh, a senior a senior Western monk. And uh, he was pointing out that, you know, there have been heresies and attempts to change and distort Buddhism from the beginning. You know, all the way back to the Buddha's lifetime, you know, you had Devadatta and so forth. And uh, you just have to have faith that uh, Dhamma is going to abide. You know, there's something about Dhamma that is just worthy of surviving. And it, it very probably will until it has completely run its course. So it's I don't think there's any need for alarm. Also, there's, uh, you know, some pretty good evidence that there is like an increasing reaction against the insanity of the progressive left. You know, when you're maybe, I mean, there could be like Buddhist Sunday schools where they're teaching critical race theory to the little Buddhist kids or something. I don't know. <laughs> My goodness. Uh, yeah, I think you're right. Um, I've, I've seen more than one writer uh, dis, uh, describe what we're seeing on the left as late stage leftism. Um, you know, these are not the Red Guards. These are not people that are willing to sacrifice or, or even embrace leftism as a sort of a religion. It's uh, for most people, it's something that they, they jump on the bandwagon of because most people jump on the bandwagon, you know, um, and uh, it's been pointed out that, uh, you know, in Germany, Germany um, in the 30s, uh, there were a whole lot of communists. And then when Hitler came to power, they all became Nazis. And when the Nazis yeah. came to power, they all stopped being Nazis again. People will jump back and forth, especially um, from extreme position to extreme position. Yeah, I mean, the human being is a social animal. 
So, I mean, that's just, we've got very strong survival value that you're conforming to the, the, the worldview of your tribe. Because then otherwise, you know, if, if every tribe's person has a different interpretation of reality, the tribe just disintegrates. And that's still, that's still the case in, you know, 21st century America. That, uh, you know, if, if we don't settle on some set of values like, like we had, you know, that were, you know, bestowed upon us by the founding fathers, you know, some sort of uh, enlightened, enlightenment, you know, philosophical oh. point of view, where at least you're agreeing that everyone has the right to disagree that kind of a thing, then, I mean, that was, that was a relatively wise point of view. It, it allowed for people to believe their own things, you know, to follow their own religions or, or whatever. Well, at the same time, you still had the, the shared, you know, classical liberal values of tolerance and, and, you know, everyone, you know, at least agreeing that America is a great country and freedom is good and freedom of speech is good and that sort of thing. And even that is under attack now by the left, but the left has uh, gotten so far left that, um, yeah, it's starting to disintegrate. You know, it's like uh, something like critical race theory or or um, oh, like trans athletes competing in women's sports. It unifies the right. You know, every most people on the right agree. You know, that stuff is bullshit. But on the left, you know, it's like fifty fifty split, which is causing the whole the left to, oh, to right. be weakened. The, so. There are insane leftists out there, and even you know they are not happy with what's going on. I'm, I'm seeing more and more op-ed articles are leaking through the censorship. Um, where um, I recently read something about how basically um, the left shot itself in the foot over COVID, the left shot itself in the foot over the 2020 election, the left keeps shooting itself in the foot. And again, this is a this is a symptom of the fact that it's in its late stage. It's thrashing around and dying, unfortunately doing a lot of damage in the meantime. But, and as you point out, this pushes people in the other direction. You get the opposite a lot of the times of what you want. You know, I don't know how many times I've heard somebody on the left making like an insane statement. And I'm like, my first thought is, no, this has to be like a joke trolling. I mean, when um, I forget, actually it was one of the leaders of Black Lives Matter came out with something basically calling for uh, appropriation of white people's property. And, uh, you know, we're, we're coming for it. They were doing that. And I'm like, no, they would never say that. Like, the, you know, this is this sort of this will turn so many millions of people against them. But no, sure enough, um, it's so counterproductive. The, the more insanely um, and, and again, it's, it's like it's a hysteria, like a hysteria. Um, and it just it just they get the opposite of what they want. So these things. Balance yeah. out. So on the bright side, uh, the like the crazy leftist Buddhism that has taken over the West, more or less, is late stage leftist Buddhism. And uh, something is going to replace it. And it's probably going to be something more traditional. I would mention that uh, a lot of these articles, um, but written by leftist Buddhist scholars in these leftist Buddhist magazines and so forth, or, or being preached at leftist Buddhist meditation centers like Spirit Rock, uh, mm -hmm. you know, they're calling for, you know, special sanghas for people of color and you know white people are like how they're like um is appropriating buddhism and just taking it over and just leaving no room for you know buddhists of color and just completely ignoring that most of the buddhists in the west are buddhists of color because most of them are brown skinned south asians and southeast asians and then they're they're largely ignored because they're the left is just so left centric you know yeah. and all see is the enemies on the right and they just kind of ignore the people that don't fit the paradigm you know like successful asians in the west who are more successful than most white people that sort yeah. of thing. well it, it, it goes completely against what i always regarded as the spirit of buddhism it's from a, a mahayana text but you'll you'll recognize it where um the uh when the the young man who would later become the zen patriarch approached you know he wanted to learn uh the dhamma they said oh you're from the south you know, Southerner, uh, land of hunters, people that aren't so good. And he said, yeah, Although there are, yeah, there are people from the north and there are people from the south. But in the Buddha mind, there are no people from the north and there are no people from the south. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the, the Buddhist Sangha was supposed to be that way. Like the Buddha gives the example of all the rivers of the world flow into the same ocean and became the, become the same ocean. All the different castes and classes and ethnicities flow into the Sangha and become one Sangha. You know, whereas, 
Yeah, which is essentially the opposite of what the left is doing, where they're trying to segregate, you know, this yeah. color of, of Buddhist from that color of Buddhist and progressive stack and put people yeah. in certain places. These Buddhists have this sexual aberration, and those Buddhists yeah. sitting <laughs> have a different sexual aberration. Well, yeah, you know, we'll go on all night, but I mean, it just seems so insane that you would define yourself by what you do in bed. I yeah. mean, it's like one tenth of your time, maybe. It's like, um, I don't know, it's silliness, silliness. So I guess we've uh, pretty much covered uh, the state of the Sangha or the state of the Dharma in uh, in Buddhism. So, uh, and it has been an hour, so I guess we should call it good. We probably should. We probably should. We don't want to risk uh, boring our viewers. And of course, if they have any questions, they can put them down in the comments section and maybe we can do another video to address specific uh, thoughts and ideas. All right. Sounds good. Groovy. And uh, you're welcome to, uh, I mean, do you have, uh, do you remember the... Uh, the the link to uh, Navakavada. What is that on uh, Bitshoot or is it on yeah, you? Bitshoot. Yeah, maybe if uh, you send it to me, I'll put it in the, the comments oh. below. Okay, and sure. Thank you. Chin below. Yeah. And uh, my links will be under this also. Really? So, really? I'll update yeah. all the links and stuff too. I think I've got all of your links on the Navakavada.org uh, website right now. Oh, um, okay. Wow. I've got I've got to kick my butt to start working more on this stuff. So all right, yeah, it's getting dark for you. You're almost in total darkness now. I know I'm gonna to have to start turning lights on here pretty soon. So we better sign off for now. But uh, right. thanks for having me. Yeah. All righty.